Hello everyone, Denise Fleck, the Pet Safety Crusader here. And today I'm going to talk about ingested poisons. We're rounding out um, National Poison Prevention Awareness Week, which was last week, and we preceded it with inhaled poisons. Last week we discussed absorbed poisons through the paw and any part of the skin, including the nose. And today I'm going to talk ingested poisons. So we're taking, once again, a page out of the Pet Safety Bible to talk about poisoning in your dogs and cats, but I'm also going to chat a little bit about birds and rabbits as well. We all know dogs love to chew, and cats will nibble on plants as well, and do you know just a few petals or leaves from a, what's considered a true lily can be fatal to our feline best friends? So it's just so important, you know, I go back to this so very often, but get down on all fours and look at life from your pet's perspective. What's perfectly clean at five foot six or six foot two, wherever you may stand, is a whole nother world at seven to 22 inches off the floor. And if we're talking bunnies, that may be even a little bit lower. So just make sure you keep a, a, the scene safe and clean because those noses that can smell so intensely will find a way behind cabinet doors and up onto shelves or countertops to find something that truly can be harmful for them. And as the adage goes, size does matter when we're talking about poisoning and, poisoning and our pets. What's gonna kill a Chihuahua may have absolutely no effect on a St. Bernard or a Great Dane, but still, um, even with size differences being an issue, some pets are just more sensitive to certain toxins. So the best bet is to always err on the side of caution and make sure your beloved dogs and cats don't get into anything that can be harmful to them. I know we can't keep them in a plastic bubble. Life is going to happen, and that's why you all need to know pet first aid and know what to do. But um, we just need to do our doggone best to, you know, keep them out of harm's way. Hey, Cheryl, so nice to have you joining in there. Has the weather warmed up in your neck of the woods? Um, please, everybody, as you're joining in, say hey so I know you're out there. I do want to mention that with our dogs, um, chocolate accounts for about 50% of the poisoning incidents. And it isn't, you know, always just around the holidays because people, well, my phone's buzzing under my hand here. Um, people have chocolate all, all year round. And I think, I know I've talked about this before, but the, the dangerous element in chocolate is theobromine. Theobromine is both a cardiac stimulant and a diuretic. So it will speed up your pet's heart and lungs and it'll pull fluid out of the body in the form of vomiting and diarrhea. And the real clincher to this is there's no specific antidote for chocolate toxicity in our pets. Dogs, cats, and ferrets are most at risk. So what you're going to want to do, if it's a dog, um, always check with your um, veterinarian first. Because, you know, every pet has different health conditions. And you never know what the latest protocol is. Something could have happened 10 minutes ago um, that the pet poison helpline will know about that I don't even know about yet. So, you know, do check with your veterinarian. Do use the pet poison helpline. I'm leaning over here out of frame for a minute simply because... Yes, I did. But um, the petpoisonhelpline.com is a great resource for you. Um, they have videos that you can watch. They have information. And obviously, they have the helpline anytime you suspect your pet has been poisoned. Hey, Lori, nice for you to tune in from Louisiana. And it looks like upstate New York still has a lot of snow, yet is sunny outside. So I'm being your weather bunny as well today. Um, but back to the chocolate, um, what was I saying about it? Oh, but, you know, do ch always check with um, your veterinarian or pet poison control first. But with dogs with non-caustic ingested poisons, we generally want to induce vomiting with fresh and bubbly 3% hydrogen peroxide. So get yourself in a first aid class or read the Pet Safety Bible so that you really get the scoop on how to do that correctly. The latest information is never, ever, ever try to induce vomiting in our feline best friends. Now, some of you may have been even told differently about by me by that in the past, but that is the latest bit of business. Um, even veterinarians have like a 51% chance, just a little bit better than a 50-50 chance of getting a cat to um, vomit in a vet clinic. 
Um, and, and just like with birds, we don't want to do that either. We want to get quickly to the vet because there's so much of a chance of um, causing aspiration. When you're inducing vomiting, you could uh, actually have them regurg <laughs> regurgitate their vomit into their lungs. And then we've got a real serious scenario. So with dogs, make that call first. And if you are told to do so, you're going to use that fresh, bubbly, non-expired um, hydrogen peroxide that hasn't ever been too warm. Hydrogen peroxide does best refrigerated or at room temperature. If it gets too warm, it'll lose its efficacy. So it won't um, help your dog um, vomit. For kitty cats, we're going to get to the vet. They do best under veterinary care when we need to get some ingested toxins out. Same with the birds. And don't ever try to get a rabbit to um, to induce vomiting on. Rabbits actually cannot throw up um, like horses. So, you know, except for the dog that we can call ahead and get that confirmation, we're going to really want to get our other critters to the veterinarian when they um, ingest poison. Now, remember, sometimes they're going to lap up poison. They're going to eat something off a bush. Um, but very often, it may get in their systems because they're grooming. So that's what we talked about before, that it could be something that was absorbed as well as ingested. And in that case, it's getting in systemically in different routes. So you really need veterinary care. Um, once again, your best measures are get down on all fours and look at life through your pet's perspective to make sure you keep the scene safe. And with dogs, it may be on the floor and countertops, but I, with kitty cats, with birds, it could be up on a shelf or some high location as well. So you want to be very, very careful about that. Um, installing childproof locks. If you have dogs like my sunny dog, you see her paw prints always here behind me. Remember, I often have told you about the story of how Sunny um, could open our refrigerator and would help herself to things. And we went through quite a few childproof locks, actually, to find one that would keep her safe from herself. Hey, Barbara, nice to see you join in today, too. So, you know, do investigate ways of um, keeping things out of paws, claws, and feathers, and beaks reaped. Um, if something smells good enough behind a cabinet, and, and, a, and a great justification of this is I used to teach high school animal care and always brought in um, our canine officers from the Burbank Police Department, and those dogs were trained to sniff out scents, and they absolutely could smell the scents they were trained on if they were behind a cabinet, even under a blanket or behind a jar or something else. And, and they, these were just the slightest of scents. Um, these were generally drug-sniffing dogs, and they could very often smell the scent on a Q-tip that had only been in a jar with drugs. So we know, um, I've talked about this many times, uh, whatever story or correlation you like best, a dog can actually sniff out a spoonful of sugar in an Olympic-sized um, swimming pool full of water. Their noses are that intense. Or if you spritz some cologne or perfume on you in a room and you can smell it in the room, the dog can smell that same amount of cologne in a closed in stadium. So think of, you know, football or soccer or some kind of enclosed stadium like that. The dog can sniff, you know, that same little amount of cologne in that big of a, a space. So their noses are truly, truly intense. Whatever type of ingested poison it is, whether it's plant or food or chemical or cleaner, um, you, your pets may have all kinds of varying symptoms. And sure, we can all learn what the symptoms are associated with the different toxins, but just like when your pet is ill, um, when it isn't poison related, I don't necessarily want you to memorize a list of injuries, or, or I should say signs and symptoms, but tune into yourself. What do you feel when you're not at your best? You may have some swelling and redness or soreness. Maybe something is bleeding. Maybe you're sick to your stomach and vomiting or having diarrhea. Um, you know, pretty much all of the same signs and symptoms, if we tune into our pets, we can notice them as well. A few different things that our dogs and cats display. Um, one would be panting. Sure, we'll pant on a hot day or after we've run a long race or, gosh, maybe it's just climbing the stairs or carrying in the groceries. Um, dogs can pant from overexertion, but dogs also pant as an evaporative cooling system. They bring cooler air in over their tongues and into their lungs to cool themselves off. Cats are much more heat tolerant, so if you're seeing a cat pant, she is generally in considerable more distress. 
But panting on a dog or cat can also mean pain. Squinting, particularly from a kitty cat, can mean pain. And obsessive licking on a joint can mean pain. Um, it may be a, a muscle or a tendon issue, but the dog can actually make it into an open wound from that obsessive licking. So just tune into different signs that anything that isn't normal for your pet could be abnormal or not quite right, and you need to address it either by yourself, you know, for that initial first aid or with veterinary care. Um, once you notice something happens that something isn't right with your pet, gather your information. That's why I go through all of this stuff about teaching you to do a weekly head to tail checkup and knowing how to check your pet's vitals. Because if suddenly he has it or she has ingested poison, you want to know if their heart rate is lower or faster than normal. You want to be able to check their capillary refill time. Remember what that is, where we lift the lip and we press on the gum and we hope that bubble gum pink color comes back in less than two seconds? That's a, a test for circulation. If you're fuzzy on that, go back and look at some of the, the videos and the blogs I've written on checking vitals. Um, you want to know if their body temperature is normal. You want to be able to say, oh gosh, I had been cleaning the toilet or the windows or whatever it happened to be, got up to answer the phone, and yeah, the cat walked through the spill. You want to be able to determine, do you think they might have ingested a tablespoon? Could it be a quarter a cup or a full cup? Um, any of that information, as well as how they're feeling, if they've actually vomited, if the pet is having a seizure, is so very helpful when you make that call to the pet poison helpline or to um, your veterinarian in determining the next course of action. So like we said, with birds, with cats, with rabbits, absolutely, anytime you feel they've ingested poison, get them quickly to their exotic or their specialty veterinarian. With dogs, call ahead and confirm with your vet or animal poison control that you either need to induce vomiting or that you need to dilute the um, poison in their body. Now, in some cases, if it's non-caustic, your um, avian veterinarian for your bird may have you feed, and I know this kind of sounds weird to feed to a bird, but um, egg whites and some other things to dilute just to buy you time on the way to the vet. We often do that same thing for a caustic chemicals, cleaners, something that burned on the way down, we don't want to try to induce vomiting because it'll actually cause more damage very often coming back up um, and, you know, risks the possibility of it being ingested in the lungs. So with dogs, my favorite, if you can't get water into the dog, is to feed non-fat plain yogurt. Make sure, you know, it doesn't have xylitol, any of those um, artificial sweeteners, and that it's plain, there aren't chunks of fruit in it or anything like that. The problem with milk is that most dogs and cats, once they're adults, are actually lactose intolerant, and it might just cause them to throw it back up. I have read some materials that say if the dog drinks milk and heaves it back up along with the toxin, the milk protects his esophagus from um, the, the toxin. But I have to be honest with you, I don't know how much milk would protect you know, the esophageal area um, from ammonia or something along those lines. So that's why I'm always a big fan of the non-fat yogurt. I mean, something like goat's milk or, you know, something that's lactose-free, but everybody doesn't always have that around. But, you know, more and more people have the um, non-fat yogurt around. So that's always a good bet. So just real quickly in brief, keep the scene safe. Get down on all fours and um, make sure that life is picked up from your pet's perspective, that things that are dangerous are out of paws and claws reach. Get those child-proof locks on certain things, even if you don't have children, because if you have a furry kid, you have a toddler for life, so you need to keep him safe from himself. Also, read labels and purchase more pet-friendly cleaners um, and insecticides and fertilizers and anything you use around the house. And as I mentioned last week when we were talking, maybe two weeks ago, about inhaled poisons, if you're having the house fumigated or the yard done, ask those people if it's pet safe. If they won't tell you in writing <laughs> that it's pet safe, I would be double doggone sure that I didn't let my dog inhale it, you know, until... The room was well ventilated or it had completely dried on the surface, which could be 24 hours or more. So, you know, if somebody won't put something in writing, don't take their word for it when we're talking about our pets' lives. 
And um, if the worst happens, make that call to poison control or your veterinarian. If it's a dog and find out if it was non-caustic, if you can induce vomiting. If it was caustic, if you should start the dilution process by feeding water or non-fat yogurt and get to the vet. If it is a um, birdie, a cat or a rabbit, absolutely get your way onto your um, specialty veterinarian. Uh, you don't want to wait with poisons in the body. They're not going to do good things. So um, when you, once again, when you have a furry child or a feathered one, thinned or scaled as well, um, you have a toddler for life, and it is truly our responsibility to keep them safe. So paws, claws, feathers, Bin, scales, scoots, everything um, crossed for pet safety. And I hope you guys have an awesome week. It was great to see you from different parts of the country. Um, as always, I'm always happy to see you here. I'll see you next week. And feel free to share this because the more people that know what to do when their pet isn't feeling as best, the more animal lives we can save and the more we're all enhanced by the wonderful animal friends in our lives. Bye-bye for now.